This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, I'm back. And one of the things that YouTube did is it lets me see who's a subscriber and who's not when it, you guys are commenting. So I've noticed that about 60% still are not subscribed. If you could, go down to the red button, click it. It's all it takes, and that'll help me eventually support the channel. The more folks that are able to do that, if like two weeks worth of people actually did that, I could get monetized and uh, then I'd be set. I could actually get some sponsors and that kind of thing a little easier and help pay for the channel. That'd be a great thing to reach for in the new year. And it'd be a great thing for you to reach on your phone or computer and just touch that red subscribe button. That would be great. Liking and commenting helps as well. And it'll let you jump forward, which is important on this episode because I'm going to split the first half of the episode is going to be the RPG or the board game stuff. The second half is going to be the RPG stuff, just like if it was in two separate episodes. But I put it all into one, so I only have to render and upload once. Let's get started. All right, and then this is a company I've actually bought from before, and during this week I actually got a delivery from them from their regular store out there in Medford. Um, this is Paladin, their card, collect, uh, card accessories. You can put lots of different shapes and sizes of cards, even the weird ones from various games. They do not tell you what size goes to what. Um, you will probably have to use Board Game Geek's card sleeve calculator. They have a whole list of all the different ranges and sizes. Very comparable to what uh, Fantasy Flight used to make, and this will be a more consistent size because when Fantasy Flight moved to Gamegenic, the sizes changed. If you wanted to get, say, the Percival line, which uh, used to be the gray line from fin uh, Fantasy Flight, then uh, it would be about a buck cheaper to pick up from um, Paladin here. And the main thing is you got to order ahead of time. If you just want to pick stuff up as it goes, you can go to paladinsleeves.com. They have a regular store, and you can pick things up just about every size you could want, and it's been a reputable company. This time, they're also making like barrels and iron and other things that you can use in various board games or card games or whatever you've got as counters and tokens and that kind of thing. If you'd like that premium upgrade, then you can jump on this Kickstarter. First up, we have a game that says it's for kids that are six and above, and it's called Color My Critters. But when a six-year-old thinks of color, they're going to draw all over it. They are not going to be able to understand that color splotches blend together and become different colors. I don't think a card system is going to make that work. Maybe the Pantone game at best. So while it has little cute critters and things like that, I think you're going to just end up making a child insane by not being able to color it in because it says that it's supposed to color. And it's about color. And then they're going to want a color. Uh, and then you're going to have a game ruined. So um, I think that's a little bit of a mistake. But it might still be fun for somebody who's older that uh, wants to take some art classes. And maybe they're doing a little art theory stuff in uh, middle school or late elementary school. And are less inclined to just scribble all over a thing. Understanding that you know not everything is to scribble on. And for those folks, I think it might be something that they can pick up pretty pretty well. It is about splattering stuff, and I know there's a Nintendo uh, Switch game called Splatoon that uh, is about paintball and that kind of thing. The fantasy elements may all come together and make sense to those types of kids. So just wanted to throw that out there that I don't think the lowest age range is the ideal for this. Then we have a puzzle game, The Ugly Griffin Inn, where you have a bunch of different people that have very particular tastes when it comes to where they sleep and you have to figure out where in the inn you can put them and uh, that's pretty neat you can uh, shuffle the deck and that's acts as the randomizer and uh, as you pull more cards and you're going to have a lot of difficulty trying to sort it out maybe it's a situation where you pull 10 and you just try to figure out where of the nine you can actually seat maybe kind of like a sudoku puzzle uh, in the mechanical way that it's put together and and uh, a little bit of that infographic style. I call it infographic style because if you go to the infographics YouTube channel, it'll look exactly like these. Um, maybe you would call it Adventure Time style. Whatever you've been watching is, is up to you. Uh, I think it's uh, approachable. It's not you know too crazy. It's definitely not a violent situation. Um, but if you have any history or uh, concept of what these uh, types of fantasy characters may be, then it would be helpful. Uh, something you could play pretty quickly. And just like a Sudoku puzzle, knock out pretty, pretty fast on a break. It might be fun. 
And still in that kind of fantasy realm, this is Rise of Tale of Kingdoms. And the idea here is you pay a couple bucks for the rules and you print off the sheet yourself. It's really just a couple bucks. You take a deck of cards, whatever your favorite deck is, and that turns it into a board game. Instead of having your regular suits, you've got influence, wealth, citizens, and military, and uh, you use that as the suits. And I think it's a good way to reuse something you already have. Keeps the cost down, keeps the uh, footprint of your shelf down as far as possible. I mean, it's the same deck you would have had already and maybe a couple sheets of paper. Not that bad a deal. You can laminate it if uh, you're going to replay it a bunch of times. And if you don't, it's not that big a deal. But uh, maybe you're on vacation. Maybe you're in a, uh, I don't know, a cabin somewhere, whatever the case is. And you just needed to have something a little bit different than the regular gambling games. This would be a quick way to enhance the materials you've already got. Then we have suits. The ladies. I don't know why it took four editions for them to get to female characters, but it did. And I guess that's alright. Um, maybe it has something to do with we were waiting for the pink color to show up. I don't know. The thing is, this is a card game where, much like Exploding Kittens, you're going to be taking cards from each other. Um, probably in secret, but there are going to be many different ways for you to resolve the very different cards. It does not have a lot of text. It doesn't have a lot of things going on. It'll play fast and uh, still be fun. So if you have somebody in your gaming group and you don't want to explain a whole lot of rules, you just want to be able to get in there and play, then uh, this would be an option for you to do so. If you didn't have, like I said, Exploding Kittens or one of the other ones already. Um, hopefully this does well uh, with the, the people that are playing the game. It's almost at the goal, about 90% as of uh, me recording this. And uh, I just think that they should have maybe switched that over. They could have had a bunch of these characters being female rather than just having it specifically this time it's female. Um, I just think we should be gaming with everybody, you know? And we have another premium edition from Queen Games. They have made tons of games and have been repackaging them all year long into better uh, boxes. This time, as you can see in the key features, you get all the expansions, you get different modules, you get a tile dispenser that uh, looks like it's uh, it's probably cardboard, but uh, maybe it's a laser cut or something like that that is useful. Um, if you already play the game Alhambra and you haven't picked up a particular expansion or you just want the um, upgrades or you've been holding off on it and you heard good things about this game now is a great time to pick this up so that you can get all of the cool stuff that goes along with it the tile dispenser is um, a christmas bonus for the kickstarter but not necessarily a kickstarter exclusive as you can see it will go for 25 bucks and that's quite a lot um, maybe you can turn it into a uh, i don't know some type of uh, dice rolling setup for uh, another game or whatever just by putting a piece of cardboard on the side you can figure that part out yourself if uh, you would uh, like to do so otherwise you know jump in and uh, enjoy this tile game then we have the battle of armageddon from compass games that makes other types of games this is specifically about the final battle as described in the book of revelations in the new testament of the bible and um you know it was written in a time when they thought the mediterranean was the navel of the world and didn't include a whole lot of other things going on um so with the usa being there it's it's kind of a they definitely weren't thinking of you know 2000 years later that existing um they would have barely known much about europe uh so and the east definitely uh, whatever they picked up from the silk road um but Magog, the Arab, and Israel, those are the originals in the book of the people fighting against each other. Um, as you can see, there's planes and other things going on. I, I, uh, if you're into this, I know a lot of these like QAnon people are um, really into it. Uh, there's some folks that... I just don't think this is the war game for... For this type of battle, I think you could get a lot more fun out of it unless you were specifically kind of nuts about uh, the idea of this particular end of the world. Um, you know, uh, there's there's probably better games out there. I'm just saying.
just too many crazies. You know what there's not too many crazies of? People that just play 80s video games. Much better option here. 12 months, 12 winter games. And uh, the idea is, like you can see Contra basically for roll type. Um, the Qbert there above and Brickles. I don't know what yours was called, Breakout maybe. Um, different options, roll and write games. Very, very cheap. All you need is some dice and to print out the, um, the sheets that are there. And you'll be able to play pretty consistently for a while. I don't know if there's going to be any um, copyright infringement uh, situations, but uh, it'll still be fun. And you can check it out. Like I said, super cheap. Maybe show some kids what uh, it was like for us back in the 80s playing these games without having to load up a Nintendo and then they'd be like, oh, these graphics suck. Because they do. Then we have Vindication, which is kind of like a fantasy exploration type game. And what you see there in the hex is an island in the center. And you're going to use the other randomized hexes to explore that island. You don't know how long the Chronicle is going to take um, because things are randomly happening all the time. There are end conditions that you're trying to meet. Uh, it shouldn't take you too long. As they say, they're 15 minutes to 30 minutes per player. So if you're going to play with just a couple people, then, uh, you know, half hour, hours, not too bad. You'll be able to get through a Chronicle no problem. Um, just like uh, a lot of campaign games, um, it can take some time. The idea here is it also has, uh, you know how like Magic the Gathering has all the different colors and they're complementary and they combine in different things. You have three different resources that combine into three other resources for a total of six. And uh, that determines uh, what type of strengths you, and weaknesses that you've got as you play through the game. This thing has done fantastic. Uh, close to 4,600 people already have backed it. Well over $300,000 spent. Because you can also get all of the things that were sold out from before when it came out. All the different expansions and other cool things. So if you've been waiting on this, this is your opportunity. Check it out because it looks like it's a smaller version of, of one of some of these other bigger games you might not have picked up because of the size. Then we have a winter game that will ship to you in summer. This is Winter Queen. Um, it looks like it's something that would be fine for the people that sing all those Disney songs about snow. Um, the idea is, it's, it's hard to describe because it seems to be just about how colors are managed. But they go on the board and it doesn't seem to matter. But somehow it's attached to the Aurora Borealis. Um, and spell books. All that type of stuff. So I'm going to say... I think it's basically a Disney princess <laughs> simulator. And that's not a bad thing, but I just seem to think that's what it is. If somebody else wants to take a look at it and uh, leave their opinion, that's what the comments are for. Then we have a very random game. This is Execution. And the theme and the mechanics, eh. The theme being the cutest way to have terrible death. So, like, drawn and quartered is cut up like a cake. Burning at the stake is, as you can see, a marshmallow on fire. Um, yes, <laughs> they're analogous, and that's fine, and it keeps it cute. Uh, but the thing you're going to do is try to kill off your friends that way. Uh, each player is going to put cards in front of another player. You'll be able to see it. And the idea is you're supposed to have the least score possible. Um, but the scoring is done randomly with this wheel after you're done. So I'm a little concerned. I think it would be more fun if it was rolled before and then you do everything you can to dump your cards out uh, to get the lowest score possible uh, by handing them to people and they can hand it out and hand it back and gang up on each other and do other weird things with it. So um, I think maybe some rules tweaks might make it more fun. But if you just follow the rules, maybe that's fun too. Then if you wanted to play a superhero strategy game like Marvel Champions, but you couldn't afford it, and you have a 3D printer, which might be why you can't afford it, then you just want to print it yourself, Pulp Heroes is the answer to all of those things going together. Um, the idea is you're going to be able to pick up a bunch of STL files and print off a game about superheroes that has a bunch of different cards and things you can print off yourself also uh, to your heart's content modify it change it around do whatever it is that you want to do 
use the rules and mechanics for the game and maybe you can make other heroes or paint it up different ways and basically you have your own little skirmish game for not a lot of money they're uh, putting all of the expensive bits out on you and you can decide how much you do or don't want to invest in order to uh, make the game happen whatever way you want uh, there are services that can print off playing cards there are services that can 3d print for you and uh, make other materials so really they're just saying here's our ip have a blast see if you enjoy it and then maybe at a certain point in the future if it's successful they'll be able to print off a big game and take all your testing and uh, fun things that you've done with it and make it better for everybody else and to, to a better box it's a good stepping stone and utilizing kickstarter as a means to advertise cheaply can't knock the business you know sense that they're using you probably saw that superhero games have a hard time folks here at what the pong didn't look and see that drinking games have a very very hard time as well and uh, decided to make extra rules to go with beer pong I'll be honest with you, I think that the game itself, if you eliminate all of the beer pong stuff, might be a fun trivia game or challenge game, but I don't think that the beer pong stuff necessarily is required and is just an expensive add-on to it. Um, having the extra die and extra rules and trying to explain it to a bunch of drunk people, and you can only have four players, usually if you're going to have beer pong going on, you're going to have like six, ten people, so... You know, that part's up to you. If you're still 21-ish, then uh, maybe this will be fun for you before you're... I think I was describing it last week. You know, our booze is just too expensive for, for this type of gaming. And I'm not pouring Guinness into <laughs> a bunch of solo cups. I'm drinking it out of the bottle. So, uh, yeah, if you're in that age range and you want to encourage uh, over, you know, having a, uh, people over and having a good time with uh with some beer pong and maybe this will help you with that but uh otherwise i would get rid of all the cups and then just play the rest of the game as a regular fun game with challenges and other fun stuff going on then we have uh another one of these games where the theme and the game are separate but this is barking spiders 2 which is an expansion to the original game which is very much like gin rummy um, the Barking Spiders joke, I was told when we were like three or four years old, and uh, I think my uncle, my mom's brother, uh, told it to us, but we didn't understand its connection to flatulence, so we just thought that there was some type of weird spider in the backyard, and we weren't supposed to go back there. <laughs> and for the rest of our lives, until it was further explained, oh, this is someone trying to cover up their gas, we had no idea what was going on. The box, everything about this, does not evoke that same feeling. It looks more like something you'd find in an Old West game or a steampunk game. So that throws things off a little bit. Uh, maybe the the gas part and, and the steam is the connection. Um, I don't know. Lots of people like Gin Rummy if you would like to play that. Or another game called Phase 10. Uh, then uh, this is probably you know the lowbrow version that you might enjoy with some folks. I've only played Gin Rummy with my grandma, so uh, I don't know if there's a big movement for it. If it's enough to have a sequel, though, it's a cheap enough price, maybe you'll enjoy it. Then we have a game that might actually work for kids. This is Diced Cheese, and uh, I mean, these kids are still eating those little cheese wheels with the goat on them, so they're going to understand the concept they are uh, dice but in this shape of a wheel of cheese and uh, you play it by doing all these things that you see there um, I would use this probably to enhance my of mice and mystics game um, I could just scrub off the logo <laughs> and use it that way um, it's uh, hard to understand at first. Like, what is it? Like, is it a type of dice? Is it like a D6 that just happens to be in cheese wedges? How does that necessarily work? Like, no, it's its own game. And uh, it does use the uh, D6 as, or D5 as its own uh, system, as if the uh, Swiss cheese components would be, um, would tell you, like, the, the roll. So, Depending on if this is something that you don't think you're going to lose a bunch of pieces for, or like I say, if you want to combine it and to use another game like Dice, uh, Mice and Mystics, then uh, you know this could use a bunch of different functions for you. 
or be used in a bunch of different functions for you, it might be a fun game to go along with it. Just have to read along and see if you're so lactose enthusiastic and you'll enjoy it. Then we have a game that doesn't look like it's doing very well, but hopefully we'll come back around because it looks like it could be very interesting and fun. And this is Father Brown Investigations, The Death of Sir Percy Coldwell. I keep seeing Father Brown show up on like different TV sites and have yet to be able to watch it. I think it's a BBC show. It might be something in Canada. Um, I know there's a lot of different ones. We get them for work. So um, I kind of hold off on a lot of the foreign shows just because I'll end up having to watch it uh, come through for work. Uh, but it seems interesting. This is a priest and an investigator. Um, I'm not sure what the situation is with the licensing and all that. There's all new art and different things that go along with it. Um, but if anyone is a big fan, feel free to let me know in the comments about uh, what the franchise means to you and if you would be interested in this game. There are a couple different versions. There's like the dip your toe, just get the cards version. And then there's a more deluxe one with a game board and other components and uh, game modules to be able to play with different styles and different rules. So depending on how big a fan you are, then uh, maybe this will be uh, a good option for you. The uh, hand-drawn art is pretty cool, keeps everything nice and thematic, even when it's about a more modern um, concept, like the tattooing. Then we have another game that is struggling a lot, and I do not know if they're going to be able to recover. It'll probably be the type of game that gets uh, brought down in its expectations quite a bit. I don't know if having the lyrics is going to cause them a lot of problems. Um, there is a lot of publishing rights and things that go into uh, the song games, a lot of folks have gotten around um, the uh, use of them. This one has a QR code. I'm not sure if that QR code is going to take you to like uh, Universal Music Group's page or whatever the case is that has the video for the particular song on it, which will change over time. I tried to design something myself that used QR codes to help explain what was going on in Cards Against the Humanity cards, and then I realized I'd have to make a whole separate website to go along with it and that was just a huge pain in the ass to have to maintain um, it's only got just under 30 backers and I think that's gonna be a hard one to go through um, the other thing is you're singing a song not a lot of people want to sing so it's uh, definitely a party game maybe you could play it over uh, TikTok or uh, zoom or something else in the meantime um, and maybe introduce your kids to it. They all, uh, kids always like to sing, but they're not going to have a huge background of information. But if you want a better party game, Banter might be the one for the people that like to talk trash, as you can see from the name. It gives you the prompts to build your insults. So that randomizes the things with all the different decks, makes all the things special and fun, and that means that you can add a, a bunch of stuff just like Cards Against Humanity to it uh, to help with your trash talk. And I am a firm believer that trash talk is the pinnacle of what language can be. If you were to watch the BBC documentary Rude Britannia, you would see just to what level um, you can take the, the, the highbrow uh, approach to uh, talking trash. I love it. I like the idea of it, and I think, just like Cards Against Humanity um, does the thinking for you, I think this type of game will help do the thinking for your friends that can't otherwise talk the smack themselves. And I think you'll have a lot of fun doing it. And we finally have something for the war gamers, so you don't feel left out. This is Assault Red Horizon 41. The concept is it is a more generic uh, theater of war. You can use the map in a lot of different ways. You can change things up quite a bit. There are specific, as you can see, tanks and units and that kind of thing. But it's not specific to the battles. A lot of the maps and things are um, very keyed in to one particular section of the world. And this is just made to be a little bit more generic. So you can work out a bunch of different scenarios if you so choose. Um, yeah. If it's... Something like this that you've been looking forward to, 
there's been a battle out there that you haven't been able to find, but it is covered by, uh, I'm going to guess this is World War II, um, uh, technology range, then maybe this will help you uh, make it so there's not such a specific uh, set of requirements on the battle, if that's not the reason why you've been playing those games to begin with. Then we have Star Eater. This is a game that does a pretty good job of describing what the movement system is. It uses the word inertia right there in the title, so you have an idea that that's a mechanic that has been missing from a lot of space games that's in here. As you can kind of see as things move around, they continue to move in the direction of thrust. So. Uh, even if you turn, even if you change, you have to counteract the forces of your previous movements in order to make the full change. Um, it's a really interesting concept. People have tried to make other space combat systems that were more realistic. I think this is one of the few that's actually going to be kind of fun. Uh, I think maybe you would want uh, some type of ruler or stick to check the vectors as you move to know where you're going to have to continue to move down in um, but that's kind of up to you and your table how you want to do it you can use a lot of the different models that have been in the 3d printable uh, episodes that uh, will work really well here uh, it's not that expensive it's interesting and uh, the math of it will really help you understand how space works if you've got a uh, a younger person that you play with that uh, you're trying to show how you know uh, space combat and all that would actually function as opposed to what they've seen on TV this might be a fun way to in introduce them to that and if you'll notice here the December is back because we've started over on the clock again you have just a couple days to pick up these minis they are resin miniatures from uh, counterspell miniatures the shade collection they are meant to represent gothic horror so you have a lot of gargoyles and werewolves and other cool things that are in there very highly detailed and interesting resins on the expensive side uh it's also on the fragile side but it does make stuff that is very uh, uh high detail and easy to to paint um if you're willing to risk it and keep it all <laughs> all nice together so if you're interested in this kind of thing you like it on the shelf or maybe you would like to use it in uh, a game of yours then uh, one of these 11 different miniatures might suit your tastes um, yeah so just keep in mind resin is fragile same pros and cons here and they'd actually work pretty well if you did get those miniatures these are the dark stones cult begins where you can make your own uh, cult uh, altars and skulls and other weird things um that uh, will fit anywhere on a terrain for you know it could be in uh like a war game you could put it on warhammer 40k or you know rpgs will work just as well for this uh dioramas anything like that um these i believe come painted and they have some stretch goals and other things to go along with it so if you're a fan of hammerlock games and what they're coming out with here then uh take a look at the other stuff that they're collecting and putting together these folks are out of spain spain uk uh, mexico they've all been doing some great work with uh, minis and terrain and uh, for terrain especially new zealand has had a lot of really great work so if uh, you're in any of those uh, regions i know shipping is a concern um, maybe you might want to check and make sure that uh, they're close enough where you won't have to spend a fortune for shipping stuff but there's all kinds of people doing all kinds of great work if you don't see it on one of these campaigns you'll probably see something similar on another one in that region that's close to you but virtual deliveries have no shipping costs and that is pretty useful here because these are maps for your tabletop games especially in virtual tabletops natalie upon has done a and i'm I, it could be natalie oppen i don't know i'm just going to guess that it's natalie upon uh is um a creator of lots of different maps and has been doing so for a long time i think some of my first episodes had their uh, maps on it and they do a really good job of making 3d renders to go along with things and it really gives some life and dimension to uh the, the virtual tabletop or wherever you're going to put it you can print them off if you wanted to and use it on your regular tabletop you can use it as your background wallpaper there's no limit to what you're going to do 
other than you got to pay them for the right to use their stuff and uh, you know I think you'll enjoy it quite a bit um, you can adjust the scale do different things depending on uh, the world that you're in and uh, like I said it does give quite a bit of extra dimension uh, by the style that they've chosen there's a lot of um, extra details that can pop up and if you're going to be using minis instead of tokens or anything like that it can be really helpful even if it's sitting on top of this flat surface then we have BAG this is supposed to be a very generic role-playing system the thing that they say as part of their philosophy is to have speed above a lot of the depth that uh, and real realism that other RPGs will bring um, that's fine the real competition for this is things like GURPS that are already existing that have a lot of that extra source material as an option um, uh, it's the generic universal role playing system you can add any time frame you can add any superpowers you can add any theme that you want and there's a book for it already existing so it makes me feel like this system has possibly better competitors you'll have to see what they do that m makes it different um, by not having the level of depth then the being generic universal doesn't mean much it just means that you won't have any depth to um, the play style or what it is that your uh, your characters are going to become it, it makes it hard to, to attach to them and um, if you just wanted to play something real fast, a single battle or something like that, then uh, maybe a system like this works well for you. But they specifically talk about not wanting to play large campaigns, and that's why a lot of people play RPGs. Certainly why you might want to play Morkborg, and um, that's what... And Philip Reed is back with another one of these third-party books... I think just about every week of the last month or so, uh, maybe a month or two, we've had more and more of these third-party books coming out. Morkborg uh, had a big uh, inventory drop at one of the local uh, game stores, Lost Planet. They were uh, talking about how good a system it was. The idea here is it's like, an, uh, it's like a zine that has been expanded out into a full system, and now you're getting more creatures and things to go along with it in uh, you know, more of an Osric style, old school revival style uh, system. It is very um, uh, heavily using the yellow on black and white uh, color theme, which still causes things to pop back at you. But uh, the colors and everything are muted down, but it still jumps because of that yellow. I think it's a great idea from a marketing standpoint to utilize that that color because it gives some action, even if you're looking at something that, like the skull on the left, is more dark and muted in tone, uh, or these black and white graphics. It does still give them some kind of life, and uh, I think that's been a, uh, a great uh, driving uh, concept, uh, collecting all the, the different uh, types of books that are available for it into something that is really interesting that people would want to enjoy it's also not even forgetting the big guys that are out there if you're in pathfinder dnd 5e whatever the case is and you may need some books about allies and antagonists so these are npc characters that you can use as a nemesis you can use as uh, somebody to give you a quest or guide you on a quest or become a quest all into themselves they have some spectacular artwork that's been put together here, and um, if you're interested in any of it, maybe you could even use these uh, characters or their uh, their pictures as some type of uh, inspiration for one of the characters you'd like to play or change things up however you'd like. This is a great tool to have uh, when you're trying to populate a world out and you uh, just need something extra to go by. Especially if maybe you need a unique or different type of nemesis, you can pull aspects from the things that have been put here and make your own characters if you want. And uh, you can even check and see from their sample what uh, types of stuff you'll find out in the book, which I think is a great way to uh, make your buying consideration uh, a lot more informed because they give you free stuff to check out at first. And then if you need something for that world, be it uh, falling apart or held together, you have the ruins of generica and generica 
has popped up before. As I said, the folks in New Zealand have been coming up with lots of interesting sculpts for things you to print out on your own uh, 3D printers. And Kieran Billings is one of them. Jenica is their line of uh, different things that they've uh, been producing. Um, uh, fantasy style but uh, it could incorporate into uh, something that just happens to be older if you have um, you're running through a ruined World War II city or World War One or something like that or some type of other siege then uh, a lot of these things would work pretty well as remnants of the Romans or whatever um, type of uh, civilization has been there before so uh, if you're a fan of architecture if you have a diorama you want to put together or a big battle, or you want to populate your world out, take a look at what he's already produced. And uh, you can, because these are STL files, even though this is for this campaign, you can contact them about things they've come out with in other campaigns because it's not like they ran out of inventory. And then last week we had a really beautiful set of models and a uh, samurai. And week before that, there was some other Japanese inspired ones. This time we got a beautiful model in the Barca Grove Warden. And it is a bit of a I would say like an owl bear druid and you have a different a uh, couple of different sets of options that you can pick up from and uh, print off however it is uh, that you'd like you can make other modifications and it's a, just a beautiful set of fur with a beak and that will challenge your ability to paint and you can print these off and uh, practice all you want so uh, if you want something that's really interesting that you can scale up and scale down then uh, this is a fun interesting choice especially if you did want to as i say turn it into some type of like owl bear druid that uh, your uh, group encounters then if you like the frosted marbles uh, look for your dice they're a little bit on the sparkly side you can check out these skull splitter ones that you can actually read uh, the photography has a flash on it so uh, it's not going to show up perfectly and uh, the camera's going to throw you off a little bit but you can actually see the contrast on these numbers which so many previous dice sets were not able to do so I'm glad that they were able to think about that for people like myself that might have difficulty being able to see the damn things high contrast is really nice um, lots of different types of sets if you wanted something metallic or as you can see there red and green for Christmas or yellows and oranges and everything in between they've got plenty of different ones for you to choose from and you'll be able to read all of them then we have a relaunch of a tabletop world that I've already covered before. Um, this time they have just, just passed their goal. So they'll be able to come out. You can check them out with it as well. This is Chan Shang and it is about Kung Fu in the world of the post-apocalypse. If you watched Into the Badlands, then maybe that would give you some other ideas about how martial arts could be incorporated into that kind of world. It was a pretty good show on AMC. I believe went three seasons and had different factions and other neat things. Lots of interesting characters. And you could pull off the same thing here uh, if you, that's what you want to do. Then we have part two of Circle of the Blood Moon. This is a campaign that uh, these folks at Griffin Lore have been coming out with. This is Fire on Claymore Woods. And they claim that there are vain celestials, drunken fairies, and plotting druids. I, I mean, all the celestials are vain, right? All the different gods have their own different problems. Just look at any pantheon. But the Drunken Fairies, I think the Feywild, as inebriated as possible, as capricious as it already is, is a fun way to go. This is Pathfinder compatible. Uh, it says just Pathfinder. I'm not sure if that's 1E, 2E, or if it matters. And uh, otherwise designed for 5E. I like the artwork of the dwarf there fighting off the wolf. I think that's pretty awesome and the stalker out there in the wheat fields is evocative as well uh, i'm not sure if that's computer generated image uh or just painted on top of but it still looks pretty neat um i do like the old school look of the one on the right though they've got different maps they've got other cool stuff i'm sure there's going to be more to go along with it so if you're already invested or you want to jump in on this campaign as opposed to um you know some other offering that's out there then i'm sure they'd love the attention for you to go to the description click on the campaign link and uh, check them out then we got some stuff to help feed your imaginations when it comes to monsters these are monster description cards and they have different uh types of 
um, attacks. As you can see, that's how they're divided. Tentacles, wings, horns, fangs, or claws. And then uh, different drivers, different things to make each one of them unique that you can choose to integrate into another type of monster so that it's not just another generic thing that your characters are fighting, but becomes something that they'll never forget. And if you'd like to see how they pull that off, go ahead and take a look at the description. They seem to be doing pretty well. There's uh, almost 700 folks ready to jump in and uh, try these out for themselves. I believe they've been around before. Uh, it looks familiar, but maybe not in its full category the way it's been before. I like the idea of sorting it out by the damage type, and because then you'll be able to put it pretty quickly with an animal. And let's say it has claws and wings, then you got two selections. And then these trains are here because they're 3D printable. And um, I think, really, if they had just planned to go a month earlier, this would have been perfect for people to be able to print off as toys for their kids. It would be a great time to do that. If you want to upgrade a train game, then you'll be able to take as many of these things out and set them up yourself. I don't think they'll all fit necessarily on a Ticket to Ride board, but maybe you can make a bigger one. Lots of different options are available, and you can even get the free ones that work as Christmas tree decorations. Maybe you can print that one out yourself, paint them up real quickly. you still got a couple weeks worth of time. So uh, if you're interested in this, if you think trains are going to be your future, and you want some uh, stuff to go along with it that has more of a modern look, then maybe you appreciate these and be able to print them all off yourself. And then one of the great things about the 3D printable stuff is you can just get some weird things every once in a while. And that's what this is. Monkeys the Doors Vertel versus Turtle Stecks is weird. And you can even get uh, a pyramid and different types of weird terrain to go along with it. Obviously, the, um, the folks that are the turtles are supposed to be much more like the Aztecs. And the monkeys are supposed to be more like the Spanish, even though the monkeys are in South America natively. And the turtles are the ones that come from the sea. I don't think they thought of that beforehand, but you can get a full 3D printable game all to yourself or just use the models in different capacities. So that part is pretty cool. Uh, I can never pronounce the name of those obsidian, uh, wooden, wood plus obsidian swords that the Aztecs used, uh, but they are the most fearsome thing I would not want to be hit by. <laughs> that is on a molecular level shredding your body. And uh, I think that if I even if I was in a monkey suit, I would be afraid of it, even in Spanish armor. Um, lots of uh, neat poses. You could use it for like a Planet of the Apes game or uh, even like a After the Bomb or a Ninja Turtles type of campaign. I think it will work great for all of that. It might even work best for all of that. So uh, if you're thinking about it, take a look. After the Bomb, highly underrated. I think you should check that out. Anything Palladium is a good place to go. Now we're looking at a very expensive but hopefully useful table organizer. This is to keep dice and make it easy for you to keep cards and other things around the table. Uh, games like Lobotomy would serve really well by having those uh, chevrons that the cards are standing up in because that'll help take up less space. I love the game Lobotomy but I hate the amount of table space it takes because I might have to build a whole room just to get all the stupid cards to be laid out properly for more than a solo session. And uh, I tried to build the same kind of thing out of Lego, and it just didn't work as well. They seem to have cracked that nut pretty well and made it in a, into something that fits pretty easy. But that ain't cheap. It is a lot of woodworking. Wood itself is expensive. Doing all the turning and everything else is expensive. And then somebody's got to get paid at the end of all of that, too. So, um, you know, if you have the money to accept this type of premium, if you already have a game ready to go that this would work for, then I think uh, it can't be beat. I think you'll be happy with it. But it's not like a broken token or one of those other game organizer systems that's perfect. It may be a little bit on the imperfect side, uh, but then again, it might just fit whatever uh, play style you guys need for your nightly or weekly games. And then we have Inglorious Wizards. Uh, take on those Inglorious Bastards. These are uh, ready to go. Uh, not just wizards, as you can see, there's also a female adventuring party that has multiple different uh, classes available. But these are 
for any type of tabletop gaming. There is even a machine gun in there and a blunderbuss here and there thrown in. But the wizards are of various types. One looks like Gandalf. One looks like, uh, I think that's supposed to be Merlin from, um, what's the one? Excalibur. Monty Python. The guy Bob's there. Uh, the guy was on the bridge. Um, some Even some witches of various types, young and old, that kind of thing going on. You can use these for a lot of different campaigns. You can use them for a lot of different NPCs. Or even if you have a favorite one, they are... Um, pretty fantastic and have various options going along with it. I don't think you need to have uh, either Gandalf or Dumbledore with a submachine gun. You can contact them about it, but uh, if that is what you're going for, if you like that anachronism, uh, maybe it's a Halloween party and they're going to go rob a bank, whatever the case is, uh, that is up to you. I think it's a pretty neat uh, set of sculpts and you can contact KLT Studios about it if uh, you want to make any changes or see what else they've got. And that's it for the episode, but folks did want to see what else I was painting, and it's been a while and I forgot what the last thing was, so we're back with uh, Massive Darkness. You can follow my Instagram if you want to see these things as they come out. Uh, this was a wear tiger. I decided to go more of the Savannah look, so I went out and I found some uh, little uh, tufts down at Lost Planet. They had a big uh, variety. Uh, which was different than the ones that were over at the Warhouse. I checked that out. Uh, I was able to order some little uh, steampunk uh, cog pieces for like 10 bucks, and I was able to put this uh, living construct with uh, some patinaed and uh, like melted down with coal and ash on top of them, uh, pieces of um, you know like uh, clockwork parts. And I thought that fit really well for that construct, which I thought was like a really boring sculpt. It was kind of hard to tell what was going on with it, but that was just the nature of the sculpt. Um, but by throwing in those little mechanical parts, I thought that would still look fine, even as you move through the rest of uh, the cave system that you fight in in Massive Darkness. And then on the right was Graz and Prug, which is like an Etten, and this, uh, I thought, you know, the dirt from... GW's textured paint line would be fine. I think this is some type of mud, um, and I thought it looked pretty good. And then I started getting into the heroes. I went down to the aquarium store, and I picked up a bunch of little resin pebbles, and I thought maybe I would take a sledgehammer and just hit it really hard and try to break them, and that didn't work either. Um, I have not had a chance to get out to the hydraulic press uh, to try to smash these little um, resin or acrylic stones because I wanted there to be a brighter uh, type underneath that uh, wizard there. Um, I wanted to have a nice purple look and uh, make little signs and things. I liked that uh, thought at least before I couldn't demolish these little aquarium stones into something smaller. Uh, we have a bit of a paladin that I thought would be good at fighting the cyclops and fighting the cyclops in uh, the Odyssey happens out on the beach so gave him a nice sandy kind of uh, uh, look to it and then the character there that is supposed to be more of the thief I figure there's more stuff to steal in the city so I gave it more of a cobblestone look to go along with that one of the cool things about Massive Darkness is they are pretty gender balanced in that there was a male and female counterpart for every single one of these styles and we'll get to some of those in a second we have the basic barbarian of Bjorn and uh, I think I forget what her name was something with the Z might have just been Z as the Dwarf Princess um, and little Ned there with his hammer and uh, you know the the Gandalf requirement uh, in a lot of these because that's what a wizard's supposed to look like, right? Um, I was able to go to Michael's. I found these weird blue rocks that I was going to use for some Kingdom Death stuff, and I used it up, and I just had this pile of rocks left over, and I never knew what to do with it, and I started thinking, well, let's look at the bottom of the container full of rocks, and maybe there's some tiny ones. And I really like the way that the, the blue looks on the little tiny rocks and uh, how it fits to make it look like even, you know, behind my wallet there that he's really like on a rocky precipice opening himself up to whatever magics are required for the time. And, uh, you know, the other folks, it just seemed to fit the red rocks going against the green or uh, the more orange, keeping it monochromatic with Bjorn and the gray being nice and neutral against the pink that uh, the lady dwarf needed. And as a dwarf, I thought the ladies were supposed to have beards, but I guess she's just short instead. 
then I think these folks came in one of the, I know for sure the ones on the left came in one of uh, the expansion boxes and then the folks on the right I think are stretch goals. The ones on the right are uh, uh, gender balanced versions of other stuff that we saw. And the ones on the left are just options, mask on, mask off of what I think are paladins. I like to make the cobblestone a little bit larger for these guys, make it a little bit brighter. Um, I think that they would be the type of people that would be in the city with that type of armor as opposed to out in the wilderness uh, doing stuff. So more like a guard uh, is what I envision them as. And that's why they're like that. And the uh, lady who's more like a fawn, uh, I think is the correct name. Um, I put some uh, symbols underneath her. I prefer the Lovecraft ones. So there's some elder signs and other things that are uh, etched in and then I glued the coal and stuff on top and if I ever get those uh, stones smashed then I'm going to use purples and blues on top of that to create those same elder signs to continue that look but in the meantime it's just you know kind of there with the paint and that's fine and I had a lot of fun with the more African look uh, on this lady because um, I was able to use a bunch of different uh, ground textures and some of the other types of colors that went along with the uh, the way that her, her dress flowed I was using for different things. Um, a lot of different uh, colors that I picked up from Turbo Dork in uh, her jewelry and all that kind of thing. And it looked pretty nice. I thought I liked that, how that one uh, came out. And uh, I would like to be able to use it for a bunch of different games if possible. Because I'm proud of how that one came out. And then these are gender balanced versions of the same type of woodland elf and they had the same problem their skin's so light that they don't photograph there is actual detail in the stuff that i made but i just couldn't get it to focus on there instead it kept focusing on the moss that i put on the bottom i had some old dried out moss from when i was promoting my zombie movie pretty dead which you can watch for free on amazon if you choose to do so and i get a buck 50 if you watch it all the way through so that would be kind of cool um but uh, it looked like branches, and it's kind of spongy, and it didn't look like it was going to fall off or tear or anything like that if uh, it sat in the uh, the bin that I th chucked these guys in after I'm done varnishing them. So, uh, yeah, it just looked like it would be a pretty cool little branch thing to go along with it as their um, style of dress it makes it look like they're in the trees and they're made of leaves. It all just kind of fit together, and it gave a little bit of pop of that brown color, just like the belts do, and... Uh, you know followed with that whole aesthetic and I enjoyed that quite a bit I got to break out all my different layers of greens so that part was fun too to uh, make their uh, I don't know if you want to call it a skirt but that's what it looks like to me and then just to gender balance the rest of the class photo we have uh, these assassins with the red masks and a female version of the paladin a male version of the dwarf and uh, another one of the thief I think this one's the male version of the thief and then uh, there's a, I forget where the other purple uh, character was that uh, had that kind of paladin look to him. But that concludes everything uh, so far that uh, I want to put up. I didn't want to put the Oni because I think the sculpt was terrible. That's the only roaming monster I didn't throw in there. And uh, I think I already have rats completed, lizard people completed. Uh, and some of the dwarves completed. I think all of the dwarves completed, so I'm still working through. I think the next batch is going to be orcs, and I'll put those up on future episodes. If you enjoyed that, the reason why you got so many is because there was a request last time of, hey, where's all the minis? And uh, you can throw those types of requests in, comments, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes I get weird comments, and I give you know the best answers I can back. Uh, for, I don't know if they're what people are looking for, but they're the best I can come up with. Same as any of the other commentary I put out here. I do what I can to help the community and the people out there that are doing their best to create good things. And uh, I don't really charge for it. Uh, sometimes people will uh, offer to support the channel and uh, you know help out on an episode, which is great. But really, the only thing that can truly help me out is if you subscribe. So if that's 60% of people who are watching and uh, every week coming back and not subscribed please do support the channel that way um, I like it uh, when you guys hit the thumbs up and uh, comment as well be able to communicate back and forth 
uh, try to keep it as uh, civil as I can and on the topic of the business side of this I do like finding out when you guys uh, enjoy either something that I put out or you know any of these other games so I'll know what to cover that's why we cover war games is because people were asking for it and why not when you walk into a game store you're given everything that's out there because they don't know what type of person you are and you can be uh, and the type of person that enjoys many many things and uh, you should be the type of person that has a wide variety of experiences I've never heard of some of the games that are your guys favorite ones but I've heard about them when you tell me about it and that gives us something to talk about and uh, makes the world uh, a little bit better place so I want to thank you guys for coming with me to try to make this world a better place through gaming and uh, we'll keep doing it next week when things get really really low and I get a little bit more information I will uh, put out the year end of everything that I backed on Kickstarter. I've done it the last two years and shown where they are now, what's the update, what's happened to it. And you guys are also backing a lot of those same things. So maybe you'll get some information you might have missed out on. Or just have, you know, one of those things to throw out there to be like, oh, hey, out of the 4,000 things that uh, I've reviewed, these are the... Uh, 100 or so that I've decided to back and uh, I'm looking forward to. You guys have a good one.